I was assigned the limping child, and I was, I was looking at it. I thought, well, sh geez, I can't do all of limping <laughs> in 20 minutes. So it's the painful limping child. So to start with, just a normal gait review. Normal gait is a smooth, rhythmic, mechanical process that advances the center of gravity with a minimal expenditure of in energy. Um, so starting out, early walkers, they have a very short stride length, a fast cadence, but they're not really going that fast in relation to, to how adults walk. And it, when they're standing, they typically have their feet wide and, wide and apart, a wide base of support. Their knees, ankles, um, hips don't have a large range of motion like ours would. By the age of about three, um, or until the, about the age of three, they don't have enough balance and strength in their abductors um, to maintain a single limb stance for very long. So by age seven, we think they have a pretty mature or adult type gait. I'm not gonna go into details on this. This is kind of um, older terminology and newer terminology, but basically for our purposes, we know that there's a stance phase and a swing phase. Normal gait, there's always at least one foot on the ground. And it goes from the heel strike of one leg to the heel to the, until that heel strikes the ground again. So there are different types of abnormal gait patterns. There's toe walking gait, Trendelenburg gait, that's where you lean over the side that is weak on your abductors, a circumduction or vaulting gait, a steppage gait, you would see that in kind of a foot drop sort of situation or weakness where they're lifting their, their toes and their knees up higher to, so that they can clear their toes off the ground. And what we'll focus on today is antalgic gait. So what is, what is an antalgic gait? The goal of, an, of that is to prevent pain in the affected limb. So the single um, limb support phase or the stance phase in the limb that hurts is gonna be shortened and therefore the stride length of the opposite limb or the normal limb is also shortened because you're trying to get off that painful limb as fast as possible. Um, variants of this can be the complete refusal to, to bear weight at all, and as well as the cautious gait, which be, would be something you'd see in like a discitis sort of situation. So in all age groups, what kind of things do we want to think about when we see an, an antalgic gait? Fracture of some sort, some sort of infection, whether it be a joint infected or bone infection, or like um, Dr. Meyer alluded to, the um, infection in the spine can cause an antalgic or cautious gait some sort of rheumatologic um, or other sort of arthritis. Um, could be a foreign body in the foot, especially in younger kids. They're not gonna be able to tell you, hey, there's something sticking in my foot. And their parents might not realize that either. And of course, tumors. So in younger children, our differential diagnosis um, kind of narrows down to Perthes disease, transient synovitis, OCD, uh, that's osteochondritis desiccans. They can occur in the knee on a femoral condyle typically or in the ankle and the talus bone. Um, a discoid lateral meniscus could cause pain. Um, Sievers apophysitis, which I believe was talked about earlier, as well as an accessory navicular. Um, older children also have some of the same things, but we have to expand it even further to include skiffy, slipped capital femoral epiphysis. The older children tend to get the overuse knee problems, Osgood Lauders and Cindy Larson Johansson. OCD shows up again, as well as patellofemoral type pain. Um, and then you got to consider that these older children may be sexually active, so you can't forget about gonococcal arthritis, as well as other foot conditions such as tarsal coalition. So in the history, you want to focus on the character of the limp. Is there any pain or localizing symptoms? What's the pattern of it? When did it start? Um, how often is it? Is it all the time, or is there th certain things that make the pain in limp come, come about? What was the mechanism of injury, if there was one? And is the patient still playing their sports? Are they still active? They're playing through the pain or, or have they completely stopped? So just some clues in the history. Patients have a history of morning pain or stiffness or stiffness after sitting for a long time. You wanna think of inflammatory or rheumatologic problems. Night pain could be growing pains, which we consider to be benign, even though it's very troublesome for families or tumor. Um, something acute onset course, the first thing we think of is fracture. Pain after, after activity would be overuse or stress fractures, OCD lesions in the knee or ankle, or a meniscus problem such as discoid or a tear. If it's something that starts and it's gradually worsening, you want to think of tumor, infection, a stress fracture, or again, a rheumatologic problem. Constant pain wouldn't be something, an overuse problem, because if you um, 
if you rest, it should be better. So constant pain is um, you worry about infection or malignancy. Constitutional symptoms, that's fever, chills, um, general malaise, loss of appetite, weight loss, those types of things. You want to think of, um, again, malignancy, infection, or rheumatologic problem. And then um, often associated <coughs> with a transient synovitis of a joint is a recent viral or respiratory infection. <coughs> So on physical exam, you, you basically, you really want to try to catch them when they're not, they, they don't think you're looking. Because a lot of times when you ask a child who can walk to walk, they will either walk as normal as possible or they will walk like a robot and you can't tell what's going on. So you try to get them to walk as much as possible. The younger it is, you kind of have to trick them and play games with them to get it, get it, get it a good observation. But watch how the foot strikes the floor. Is it striking flat, or are they walking and constantly walking on the outer border of their foot? Maybe their toe's broken. Maybe they have a splinter stuck under their, or their foot on the medial side, that sort of thing. Um, look at limb rotation. Is the foot pointing inward? Is the foot pointing outward? Is it the same on both sides? And joint range of motion. Sometimes you say, well, geez, that knee just doesn't bend very much compared to the other one while they're walking. Inspection. Um, <coughs> Again, look for asymmetry or any sort of deformity, swelling, um, redness, rash. Look at their feet again, their plantar surface. Look at how the limb is resting. When you walk in the room, how's the patient sitting? How are they lying on the table? If the, if the patient has an externally rotated limb, you think, well, could it be a skiffy? Are they an adolescent age? Or is it externally rotated and flexed? Am I thinking there's, uh, they're trying to relieve the pressure in their hip joint, for example, from an infection or other effusion? And is there atrophy present? That's more on the line of the intelligent gait. If there's hypertrophy, that leads to more neuromuscular sorts of things. So palpate. Try to find out where it hurts the most. Test the range of motion of all joints and compare one side to the other. Make sure in the um, knee exam of adolescence, you do examine the patellofemoral joint. We see that kind of pain all the time. An SI joint, you can palpate it, as well as flex, abduct, and externally rotate the leg. That stresses uh, the SI joint. And also look at limb lengths. <coughs> Imaging, you always want to start with plain x-rays and get two to three views. Sometimes an oblique is helpful, such as in a toddler fracture of the tibia. You want to make sure you look at the joint above and below. And if you're not sure in a young, you know, one to two year old or, or younger, you can get x-rays easily of the whole limb on one shot. If you're not sure, still, you can consider a bone scan. It's really good for osteo, good sensitivity and specificity, but it's not very sensitive for a septic arthritis. Um, you have to be careful, though, because if you really suspect osteomyelitis, it could, and it could be a bad case, it will show up cold on the bone scan. Other imaging modalities, consider ultrasound, MRI, or CT. Labs, if you're concerned for any sort of systemic problem, such as infection, inflammatory disease, or malignancy, um, you can tailor that. <coughs> For infection, we typically go with CBC with diff, ESR, um, and CRP. Uh, ANA is good for lupus, but it also can, um, is important um, because it's associated with the chronic uveitis, which could lead to blindness if you miss that. Um, rheumatoid factor is actually, I think, to me, I think of it as a misnomer a little bit because it's only positive in about 15 to 20 percent of kids with JIA. And Lyme titers, if there's any history of travel to endemic areas and, and the insect bite. So the fun part, three cases to go over and then we're finished. Two-year-old with fever, come in complaining that the limp started yesterday, but they woke up this morning, they just would not walk at all. Try to change the overnight diaper and they were screaming. So what are we thinking? Some sort of infection, right? On exam, they do have a temperature 102. They're lying in the bed with the left hip flexed and externally rotated. They, they don't tolerate any movement of that left hip, and they just won't bear weight at all. So we want to get labs, CBC, ESR, CRP, and blood cultures. And we want to start again with x-rays. So we want to get AP and frog pelvis. Sometimes, and oftentimes, the x-rays are going to be completely normal. But you may see, and what you can see on this, maybe, <laughs> is that this hip joint looks wide, the space between here to here. It appears wide. Um, you can see displacement or obliteration of fat pads, which I think is a harder finding to see. Next step would be ultrasound. So normal, here's the normal joint right here. And you can see there's, those black is fluid, 
So much increased fluid, this is a joint effusion. Now ultrasound sounds great, shows us effusion, but we don't know is it normal joint fluid, is it purulent, is it blood? So we, we need to find out. So, some places have it set up where you can get um, a radiologist or someone trained under ultrasound or CT to drain the hip and send it for labs. Or we just take it to the operating room if we're suspicious enough and start with the joint aspiration. You want to send it for cultures and for cell count. And we send it stat for cell count looking for how many white blood cells are there and what type of white blood cells. So you want, if it's greater than 50,000, we're very suspicious that's, that it's infectious. And then if PMNs or polymorphonuclear cells is greater than 75%, it's also very suggestive of infection. Also, we look at it, if it just looks turbid or purulent, we go ahead and open and drain the hip. So treatment for this kid would be urgent IND of the left hip and, and empiric antibiotics. Staph is the most common, and here's by, based on age group, is some other ones to make sure we consider. So, what, but what if there wasn't an effusion? Same, similar presentation in a kid, but there was no effusion. Let's, th let's think about more imaging, either MRI or a bone scan. MRI is good if you're really sure that you know the area that you're concerned about. A bone scan is if the exam is difficult and you just, you, you can't get the kid to not scream for anything. So other differential would be an osteomyelitis, such as on this MRI, an osteomyelitis with a subperiosteal abscess, which is an operative indication for us, or a psoas abscess. So let's compare. What's about septic arthritis versus transient synovitis? This is probably the question we get all the time. These first four criteria here are what we always think of as a Coker criteria. This one study did actually look at all five together. So a white blood cell count of greater than 12, refusal to bear weight, a fever of greater than 101.3, ESR greater than 40, or CRP greater than 2, or 20, just depends on your, um, your scale. You can see the probability of having a septic arthritis dramatically increases with more of these findings. So what about toxic synovitis? They're often not febrile or much low, more low grade, and they don't look nearly as sick. They have less acute pain and less pain with joint movement, but again, that can be tricky, especially when you're dealing with a you know, cranky 18-month-old who's not gonna give you a good exam or localize. They may just be, have pain because they walked into, you know, or were carried into the doctor's office. And we, do we do see it often as a reactive arthritis after a viral infection? And the treatment for this, give them NSAIDs. A couple doses of NSAIDs, oftentimes the patient feels fantastic, almost perfect. <clears throat> Another thing to consider, it's not very common, but is psoas abscess. So that would present with a limp and hip pain again, but actually flexing the hip relieves the pain and you can then internally and externally rotate and it doesn't hurt. You look and feel and look for a palpable abdominal mass. The psoas sign, that's positive when you act, uh, passively extend the hip that stretches the iliopsoas and causes pain, or if they actively flex the hip, that would also cause pain. Because of the proximity to the nerves, there could be a sciatica or femoral nerve um, symptoms present. You can sometimes see some vague findings on x-rays, but a CT or MRI is usually used to confirm the diagnosis, and then a CT um, or ultrasound-guided drainage is typically the treatment for this. Second case, seven-year-old boy with intermittent right knee and hip pain Progressive limp over the several, last several months, but no history of trauma. So when you watch him walk, he has what we would call a Trendelenburg gait, but it's also painful. So he's leaning over his um, right side. Every time he takes a step on the right, he's leaning that way. He has pain and decreased internal rotation and abduction. So we're thinking perthes. So finding is on x-ray, you can early on see medial joint space widening, and then you also see the irregularity and collapsing of the femoral head. So nor, uh, this is the affected side versus the normal side. If it's very early, um, bone scans will have a cold appearance, but that can confirm the diagnosis for you in an MRI as well. So this is idiopathic avascular necrosis of the proximal femoral epiphysis, typically um, presents in between ages four and eight, it's predominantly boys, and it's bilateral only in 12%. And if it is bilateral, it would be at different stages on each side. It's never the same stage. <clears throat> a 
We worry that it could be caused by some sort of bleeding or clotting disorder, and there have been studies that show it's associated with ADHD and delayed bone age. There's stages that we use on x-rays. Initial stage, you may see just very early changes or maybe a slight fracture. Fragmentation, reossification, and then healing. So the prognosis really depends on the age at presentation. When, what age were they when they started having symptoms? If it's less than six, they have a pretty good chance of having a good outcome. If it's greater than six, it's less. <coughs> it all depends on the sphericity and congru congruity of the hip joint by the time they're skeletally mature. In most patients, um, the worse the congru congruency is, of course, the better uh, increased chance they have of having degenerative changes early on. Last one. 13-year-old male with progressively worsening left knee pain and limp for two months. He was seen by an orthopedic doctor somewhere else, and he had normal knee x-rays and normal knee MRI, and said, well, you're just fat, go to physical therapy. <coughs> therapy made him worse, so he eventually came two hours to see us, and uh, reports that he can barely walk, but he can, and he's been using crutches sometimes. So what are we thinking? Slip capital femoral epiphysis. This is his actual, actual uh, height and weight there, 5'8", 292. He's very antalgic, can barely stand on the left side. His left foot is, both feet are turned out, which is commonly found in overweight kids, but the left foot is really accentuated. And you can't really move his hip at all, and he can't really lift it off the bed for you. Big thing that we see, is, it's called obligate external rotation. So when you passively flex the hip, it externally rotates. So here's his initial x-rays. Pretty normal appearance on the right. Slipped capital femoral epiphysis appearance on the left. Um, you can see that if you draw a line up the femoral neck, the femoral head does not intersect there, so it's slipped backwards. So here's the treatment for that. I'm not gonna go into that since it's a non-operative conference, but he was fixed, stabilized with one screw. So, it's a little bit of a mis misnomer. It's actually displacement of the femoral neck relative to the epiphysis, which stays in the acetabulum. So the neck typically goes anterior and externally rotates. That's where we get our exam findings of external rotation. So why does it happen? There's a lot of mechanical force on a weakened physis. So a lot of mechanical force. Most of these kids are obese. And it typically happens when the physis is weakened during puberty or rapid growth. But we have to be careful because it could be caused by endocrine disorders most commonly hypothyroid. And so if there's an abnormal presentation, patient less than 10, or if their normal weight less than 50th percentile, you make, wanna make sure that you work them up for a um, endocrine problem. We also can see this in kids who are on growth hormone treatment. So um, males a little bit more than girls um, and present at a little bit older age, and they mature a little bit older, um, African-American, Pacific Islanders, and this can present bilateral. Um, classification is what we use most commonly is stability. So is it stable? They're able to bear weight, crutches, no crutches. This is, we use it because it's prognostic of avascular necrosis. Low chance if it's stable. If it's unstable, they cannot ambulate at all. It's up to 50%. So just in conclusion, but you can use five basic questions that is gonna help guide your differential diagnosis and also guide what sort of workup and how quickly you need to do your workup. So is the limp due to pain? Is it antalgic? Did it happen all of a sudden or is it gradual or has it always been there? Does the child appear ill? Or do they have other systemic symptoms? What type of limp? We hit on that a little bit. And can we localize it? Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.